What happens when an unfortunate case of measles radically changes the life course of an entire family? This is the story of Richard Hand and his family who emigrated from England to Canada in 1895. The woman's voice you'll hear from time to time in this video is that of Ethel Hand Wilson, Richard's daughter, who was interviewed in the late 1970s. A large type headline in the Winnipeg Free Press in May of 1927 read, Pioneer of Winnipeg dies in Los Angeles. Richard was 57. The warm tribute reported how very involved he was in the musical life of Winnipeg. Richard was a brass player. His instruments were the cornet and the euphonium. In England, he served as the band sergeant of the 1st South Staffordshire Volunteer Regimental Band. So it's no surprise that almost as soon as he arrived in Canada, he became involved with the city's well-loved 90th Italian band, eventually becoming its band sergeant. When and why did he leave England? What were his plans once he arrived in Canada? And what role did measles play in the family choosing to settle in Winnipeg, Manitoba? The son of Samuel and Jane Hand, Richard was born in August 1868. He was the eldest of four children. They lived in the glassmaking town of Amblecote near Stourbridge, Worcestershire. By Victorian times, that region, often called the Black Country, was one of the most heavily industrialized areas in Britain. The manufacturer of glass had been established in Stourbridge from the 16th century. Glass from this region is recognized as amongst the finest in the world. Its golden age was the Victorian period. We don't know a lot about Richard's early life. He was still in school at age 12, but we don't know at what age he started working in the glass factory. Many boys started young. Both Richard and his father Samuel were glassmakers. The hands labored in the glass industry in some capacity for generations. Richard and his future wife, Louisa Alice Haynes, sang in the local Anglican choir. He was 22 in September of 1890 when they married in the parish church of Stourbridge, St. Mary's. They both would have spoken with that distinctive black country accent that they likely retained their entire lives. Their two children, Ethel Emily Maud, and Albert Henry were born 19 months apart in 1892 and 1893. Now, a relative of Alice, a Henry Hobson, had previously ventured out to Canada, probably in 1885, and settled for a while in Ontario. And after about four years, he went back on a visit, and he thought he sold up the store in Winnipeg and came back they thought they were going to stay, mm -hmm. but we couldn't stand the uh, way of the English living men, you know. Mm -hmm. Henry Hobson convinced Richard and his family to come with him and his family on the adventure. The two families docked in Philadelphia aboard the SS Kensington in March of 1895 in transit to Canada on speculation with $500 in their pocket. En route to Canada by train, Richard's youngest son, Albert, and three-year-old Alf Hobson contracted the measles. The families were forced to disembark at Winnipeg, which is how they ended up there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We were going to go on the homestead in Alberta with uh, mother's uncle mm -hmm. and then. Mm -hmm. But uh, Albert and their youngest, Alf Hobson, took the measles on the boat to get off the um, train at Winnipeg. Mm -hmm. And Albert landed in the hospital, mm -hmm. you see. And so did my cousin. Mm -hmm. They wouldn't let us go any further. They found accommodation for $5 a month on Argyle Street in a working-class neighborhood of Winnipeg 
alongside butchers, tailors, peddlers, and blacksmiths. Richard's first job was as a laborer pickaxing wooden blocks off Main Street in preparation for the paving of that thoroughfare. Wasting little time, by 1896, Richard had bought horses, a cow and a cart, and set himself up as a dray man. He had the horses and this was called a dray man, he used to call a dray man. And he delivered stuff from wholesalers for the stores and that. Ethel laughed to recall that their cow occasionally wandered to the nearby Drury's Brewery and got drunk on some of the byproducts. I remember we had a cow then when we had the horses, and that cow used to go over to Drury's Brewery and get the stuff. She was pretty nearly couldn't walk home. Albert and I used to have to go together, and she was feeling better than we were. Ethel and Albert attended Aberdeen School and Mulvey School. Ethel was a particularly good student. She also studied the organ no doubt encouraged by her musical father. In 1899, Alice, Albert and Ethel visited England for four months. They made the transatlantic crossing on the SS Duart Castle from Halifax, disembarking at Liverpool. I remember embarrassing my mother. Her children, Lady Tupper, was on the boat and we'd been two weeks the boat was overdue uh, with icebergs, and there was no communication. And in England, where her mother went to church, they were singing, praying for the people in peril on the sea. We'd been two weeks, and we hadn't heard where the boat was. And when we landed in Liverpool, we had the red carpet all put down, roped off to Sir Charles and Lady Tupper to go out first. And I dodged under the rope and ran down the red carpet and landed in front of these big dignitaries. <laughs> Mother could have killed me. They sailed back to Canada on the SS Parisian, departing Liverpool on November 16th, destined for Halifax. Richard was for several years the band sergeant of the 90th Battalion Band, and as the band leader was a very much older man, Richard was frequently called upon to lead on parades, much to Ethel and Albert's delight. Along with some other musicians from the band, Richard entertained leisure skaters at a nearby rink. Albert and Ethel always enjoyed free skating there. And they uh, had about six of them out of the band would have this for the winter. Mm -hmm. I'll play in, in the rink for two hours from each ten. Mother and um, Alvin and I had free passes in you know, order to go with the ghost student whenever we wanted. A mostly positive review of the newly formed Winnipeg Orchestral Society concert in February 1902 listed Richard Hand among the brass section personnel. The program included Mozart's Idomeneo Overture, the Andante from Haydn's Surprise Symphony, ballet music from Schubert's Rosamunda, and a rousing John Philip Sousa march. Richard, the musician, kept busy. By 1902, the battalion band had grown to 38 members. By 1903, though, he was ready for a change. The newspaper reported that autumn that Sergeant Richard Hand of the 90th Regiment had been a member of the band for about eight years and during that time had made himself very popular in musical circles. About two weeks ago he tendered his resignation and on Monday evening he was requested to attend a special meeting of the band where he was made the guest of the evening and was presented with a handsome gold watch suitably engraved. Sergeant Hand, who was deeply affected at the surprise of the valuable present, thanked the members for their token of regard. In 1905, Richard decided to move his family from Winnipeg to Wabagoon, Ontario, where he had purchased the austere-looking, but grandly named, Imperial Hotel. Gold had been discovered nearby, 
and Wabagoon was being advertised as a location that could someday rival Winnipeg, and even, with some hyperbole, Chicago. Sometime during this period, Richard's youngest brother, Albert, came out to Canada and spent time in Wabagoon. Ethel helped out in the hotel, and she played the organ in the local churches. I played the organ in the Anglican church in the morning and the Presbyterian church at night. Teenaged Albert was allowed to travel to Dryden, Ontario, 12 miles away, to obtain his grade 8, even though his mother preferred to keep him close to home. So, when it was decided that Albert should move back to Winnipeg to attend high school at St. John's College, his mother Alice insisted that the family follow. Coincidentally, it was around this time, 1910, that the gold boom in Wabagoon region was over. Albert attended St. John's College for three and a half years, leaving in grade 11. He served on the student council and was a keen and accomplished sportsman, especially excelling at rugby. After leaving school, Albert found work as a clerk at the Canadian Pacific Railroad, where he would meet his future wife, Lorraine Newberry. The CPR rails were the largest in the empire controlled by a single company. 27 rail lines converged there. Now back in Winnipeg, Richard decided to stay in the hotel business. The Winnipeg Free Press of November 28, 1910, reported on the transfer of ownership of the Sherman House Hotel from a Mr. Fred Hayden to Richard Hand. The Sherman House pops up from time to time in the news. There was a fire at the hotel in 1911. In 1916, a burglar was caught red-handed in the cellar with several liquor bottles tied together. He made his escape after throwing brandy bottles at the hotel porter. The year before, a man with an incurable illness who had recently learned he only had about eight weeks to live, threw himself out of a window of the hotel and died of his injuries. We only have one very early photograph of the Sherman House. The hotel's original structure dates from 1877, later enlarged and brick veneered. On the ground floor, there was an office, dining room, bar and kitchen. The second floor had a parlor and a reading room. There were 39 bedrooms on the third floor, which could fit in a hundred guests. And it was demolished in 1963 to make way for Winnipeg's then new Civic Center. The family lived at the hotel along with a waitress, kitchen girl, porter, chambermaid, bookkeeper, a domestic, and any lodgers. Louisa Alice cooked when her house allowed. In 1912, Winnipeg, a city of self-made men, was the third largest city in the Dominion, the second largest English-speaking. The previous decade had been one of unprecedented growth, and the city was enjoying prosperity and optimism. By the end of the year, however, Winnipeg would enter a period of decline that would last for nearly 20 years. By 1914, the family had upscaled to an elegant home at 211 Walnut Street and was the proud owner of a verandahed cottage, cutely named Come Again, at Winnipeg Beach, where they often hosted many friends at the weekends. There were lots of opportunities for entertainment in the city around that time, of which I have no doubt the Hand family availed themselves. The scenic 1,100-acre Assiniboine Park opened in 1909. Winnipeg was an important stop on the vaudeville circuit, hosting performers the likes of Charlie Chaplin, W.C. Fields. The Walker Theatre was a venue for theatre, opera, operetta, and melodramas. And of course, there were several venues for silent films. 
At Winnipeg Beach, Ethel recalls their bungalow-style cottage was unusual in that it was equipped with a piano, which made it a frequent venue for musical evenings at the beach. On Sunday evening, Mr. and Mrs. R. Hand entertained over 40 guests at their cottage come again. Several enjoyable orchestral selections were rendered. Winnipeg Free Press, July 31, 1915. Winnipeg Beach marketed itself as the Coney Island of the West, attracting thousands of visitors and becoming a place where classes, ethnic communities, and genders would intermingle. Going to Winnipeg Beach, just north of Winnipeg, was the thing to do. Various excursion trains would bring people from the city to the dance hall and the boardwalk and then home again. In 1915, Richard sells the Sherman Hotel and found employment in the tax department of the city of Winnipeg. Later that same year, a group of men met in the still rather new and posh Hotel Fort Garry to discuss the dearth of male singers in Winnipeg, and they founded the Men's Musical Club. The club's objectives were to participate in music making, to encourage young musicians, to sponsor visits by major musicians, and to proclaim disapproval, discouragement, and condemnation of any scheme, act, or organization which in any way had a tendency to depace the standard of music in the province of Manitoba. The previous year, World War I began on August 4, 1914, when the United Kingdom declared war on Germany. The British declaration of war automatically brought Canada into the war because of Canada's legal status as a British Dominion. Vigorous army recruitment began throughout Canada. Early in 1916, Albert enlists in the 183rd Orange Battalion to fight in the conflict. His enlistment made the newspaper where he was described as a well-known Winnipeg sportsman Albert saw active service in France. He was wounded twice, including being shot in the leg in 1917. While the war raged, the Girls' Auxiliary of the 183rd Battalion, of which Ethel was one of the vice presidents, arranged what were termed showers to collect handkerchiefs, cigarettes, chewing gum, and other comforts to fill packages for servicemen overseas. One event at Ethel's home in Bexley Court included musical entertainment. Another time, the Free Press reported the Alhambra on Fort Street was gay with merry dancers last evening at a most successful patriotic Cinderella dance held under the auspices of the Ladies and Girls Auxiliary of the 183rd Battalion, the proceeds of which will furnish comforts for the men overseas. The new jazz orchestra provided a delightful program of 16 dances and special features of the evening were fox trotting competition and spot dances. The organizing committee included Ethel Hand. Shortly after Albert's enlistment, Alice Hand was admitted in March 1916 to General Hospital for special treatment after a prolonged illness at home. This was at least the third time her hospitalization had been reported in the local newspapers. Less than a year later, Alice Hand died on January 2, 1917, at her home on Lisgar Avenue, where the family had recently moved. Alice had been ill for years with a kidney and heart disease. According to Ethel, she slept only in a chair for about six months. When the doctors had given up hope, the family turned to Christian science for healing. Alice was under the care of a Christian science practitioner, a Mrs. Jordan, for several months. The family had been attending the Christian Science Church in Winnipeg. After Alice's death, Richard and Ethel moved to the Bexley Court Apartments at 448 Sargent Avenue. In 1910, Winnipeg's growing Christian Science congregation began construction of its first permanent home 
in a fast-growing residential suburb south of Winnipeg. By 1916, the large, elegant church was completed. Richard continued to play cornet in the 90th Battalion Band. The Winnipeg Free Press of Monday, February 7, 1917, said, Another of the 90th Battalion's popular Sunday afternoon band concerts was held in the Broadway barracks yesterday afternoon before a large audience of friends and members of the battalion. Tea was served to the ladies at yesterday's concert. Among numbers on the program, were March, Waldemir Overture, Selections from the Chocolate Soldier, A Dream from Old Aaron, Onward Christian Soldiers, and Choruses for the Soldiers. Band concerts are given in the barracks by the 90th Battalion Band not only on Sunday afternoons, but also on Wednesdays when the entire battalion is present. The Little Black Devils are extremely proud of their band, and it never fails of an enthusiastic reception. In January, Albert finally returned home from the war and moved into Bexley Court with his father and sister. Ironically, as the war in Europe ended, another world war was just beginning. The battle this time was not against other men, but rather against an invisible foe, the Spanish influenza. The virus came to Canada on the very ships that carried the troops home. By January 1919, there were 12,863 reported cases of the flu in Winnipeg alone. The events of the Winnipeg General Strike were in many ways precipitated by the effects of the First World War and the flu epidemic of 1918. 1919 saw soldiers returning home after World War I only to find high unemployment and inflation. They couldn't get their jobs back and social tension was high. At 11 a.m. on May 15, 1919, workers walked off the job and marched into the streets of Winnipeg, leading to one of the biggest labor actions Canada has ever seen. On June 21st, the Royal Northwest Mounted Police and hired Union Busters rode on horseback and fired into a crowd of thousands of workers, killing two and injuring countless others. The infamous Bloody Saturday marked the end of the strike. This was the largest general strike in Canadian history and set the stage for future labour reforms. In April, Ethel married Jim Wilson and the couple moved to Moose Jaw, Saskatchewan soon after. Eight months after his wife's passing, Richard Hand married Helen Galbraith, known as Nellie, at St. Luke's Anglican Church on August 6, 1919. Born Helen Housen, she was the widow of Wesley Galbraith, who had died in 1910. Helen was a reader at the Christian Science Church and a Christian Science practitioner. Richard and Helen honeymooned in Vancouver, Banff, Lake Louise, and Seattle. Richard's second marriage enraged Albert. His mother had died while he was overseas. He saw the second marriage as a betrayal of his mother. But with his daughter married and gone to Saskatchewan, Richard could not live alone. He was very, very lonely. And um, he wrote me and uh, said that uh, he just couldn't live alone. He said... He never took the place of your mother. But he said, I just can't live alone any longer. And Albert was furious. When Dad married again, he was furious over it. In fact, he wouldn't talk to us. He wouldn't acknowledge we came back from the war. And I had a suffer with Dad. And I had to go and talk to him to be civil. Of course, it was an awful shock for him. When he went to the wall, his mother was alive. When he came back, dad was going with his brother. In 1921, Richard and Helen had a daughter named Mary June. It's possible that this child was adopted. Remember that by this time Richard was 53 and Helen was 42. Additionally, there's no birth record for Mary June Hand in the vital statistics of Manitoba. And when Helen applied to become a U.S. citizen in the 1930s, 
She indicated on her attestation papers that she had no children, although we know that Mary June eventually did marry and lived until 2001. Richard had been an active member of the ancient landmark Masonic Lodge and was very involved in many of the musical aspects of Masonic Lodge proceedings for years. In June 1923, the ancient landmark Masonic Lodge hosted a picnic for 400 people in Kildonan Park. The Lodge Band, under the leadership of R. Hand, was an outstanding feature, and their playing, both in the afternoon and the evening, proved a popular incident for all the holiday makers in the park. Richard also continued to be active with the Men's Musical Club. In March 1925, a very successful concert of the Men's Musical Club took place in the hall of the Music and Arts Building to a capacity audience and standing room outside the hall. Messrs. W. Aldridge and R. Hand were the two members of the committee to whom arrangement of the program was entrusted, and they certainly deserve the warmest thanks for their work. The program included vocal works by Schubert, Liszt, Vaughan Williams, Roger Quilter, and Frank Laforge, as well as various operatic selections. Around this time, Richard and Helen decided to move to California. Ethel recalls that it was Helen's idea because she had her relatives in California. But Richard's sister-in-law, Maggie, and his nephew, Clarence Hand, were also living there, which may be another reason the couple chose Los Angeles. When they left Winnipeg exactly, we don't know. We do note that Richard did not appear in the 1926 Winnipeg City Directory. They may have taken the opportunity of visiting Richard's brother, Albert, in Vancouver before they left the country. Their emigration papers have Richard, Helen, and Mary June crossing from Vancouver to Seattle in January 1927 on board the vessel SS Princess Charlotte. Richard brought $3,000 with him at that time. Sadly, their new life in California wasn't going to unfold as planned. Richard fell ill and died in Los Angeles at 57, just five months after arriving there. In a published history of the Winnipeg Masonic Lodge, we read, During this year, Brother Richard Hand passed away. Brother Hand had been living in California, but prior to his departure was for many years our director of music. And the contributions to our banquet programs, as well as on special occasions made by the musicians with whom Brother Hand was closely associated, forms a memory which those who were active in the lodge at that period will never forget. He was greatly missed when he left, following his retirement from business and no one of his equal in the matter of musical entertainment has since been associated with the Lodge. Helen and Mary June remained in California. We know that in 1940, they were both living with Helen's sister and brother-in-law in Beverly Hills. Helen died in Los Angeles in July of 1944. Richard's life, while not a classic rags to Richard's story, is one of a man adventurous enough to explore the possibilities that emigration to Canada might provide his young family. A man willing to adapt when adverse or unforeseen circumstances requirement. Manual labor was the start of his new life in Canada, but wouldn't be for long. With entrepreneurship, he forged a comfortable upper middle class life for his family. He was a contributing member of the Winnipeg community through his work with business and fraternal organizations, but probably even more so through his love of music, which earned him a long and respected tenure in the musical community of Winnipeg. <laughs>